Well, it's Jeff Lutz again. Jeff, glad to have you on board. We're going to find a way. There's always got to be a way to find the good news. <laughs> so <laughs> let's, let's look. Uh, got to do some digging this week. <laughs> so there was so uh, there was only one thing in the economic news today at all, and that was the beige book, the Fed's beige book. And basically, I read through the beige book, and it was beige. It was just it was like nothing of any consequence of the beige book, beige book that I could see. Did you uh, happen to check it and see anything in there? That yeah, you I, I did. The only thing I would say is they seem a little bit more cautious on the strength of the economy than they have in prior readings, which leads me to believe that they have leading indicators that are telling them that this isn't, you know, pure Goldilocks, strong economy, strong labor, and inflation coming down. Inflation, arguably, we'll see what the PCE comes out in a couple of weeks. Uh, it's supposed to be in line. And if it is in line, it's really good news for the bulls. But it looks like they're seeing some underlying issues, um, you know, in the economy that, you know, they, that would make them, I, I guess they, they've been outwardly hawkish, I would say of late. Right. And this, the beige book would lead me to believe that they're seeing some more underlying cracks. Okay. Yeah. Well, they said they're 10 out of the 12 districts. They had sales increasing or, or the overall GDP increasing still yeah. at a good rate. Uh, I I think the only crack, serious crack I'm seeing is that people can't keep spending at this rate. Yeah, I think you're right. The consumer has to run out of money at some point. And at the rate they're spending now, they would run out sooner rather than later. <laughs> yeah, uh, but that employment number, that if they're only having you know 200K jobless claims pretty consistently, um, that would tell you that a lot of people are, are working. Um, yeah. So, and it... Yeah, and it doesn't look like the spending is 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 even um, in terms of you know people and their their wealth class. So anyway, it'll be interesting to see this PCE coming up. I think is a probably one of the. It's right in the middle of the mega cap earnings too, so it's going to be I think a very important week. Right, I think you're right. All these uh, all the earnings reports combined with that, it should be you're 100 percent right. Well, the drama then next week for the economy, the drama in the last five days has certainly been in the Tesla world. Um, yeah. And uh, so let's start with the compensation package. That was the thing that broke today. So let's talk about that. Um, I was expecting. Uh, something very different because I thought they were going to have to figure out how to deal with the tax problem. Um, and yet they just threw the same, same old, same old back up there. Do you have any clue how they deal with the tax ramifications of this thing? Um, I'm not a tax expert, so <laughs> no. Um, I think they believe in the compensation package and the results. And I think they spent a lot of time in the text of the filing supporting why they did what they did. They also talked about some movements and comp in the compensation committee, some people were accusing themselves and, you know, trying to make some outward moves of like, we heard, first off, we think the plan was made in an appropriate way, but we understand the optics and we're making some moves. Um, that's a little bit what I read, but I know there's been some shows today that, that um, broke it down uh, in much more granular fashion, but I think June thirteenth is the key, you know, the 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 date to the, com the completion of all the voting should be in, you know, I guess a day or two prior to that, and um, that's going to be a big day for the company. Hopefully, it's overwhelmingly approved, right? And um, and 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 then we can move on to um, you know, how he should be compensated going forward. I thought it's pretty interesting that four of the top seven uh, investment groups. Uh, the 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 pros uh, came to the board individually one at a time and said, "Hey, we got to get this thing resolved, and we are a hundred percent for uh, you know a a big compensation package." Yeah, yeah, and that's good, and that bodes well. And I think you know th there's usually probably hints of this you know earlier, and maybe that's one of the reasons we're seeing a lot more activity. Uh, out of Elon relating to Tesla, I would say of late, especially with all the, uh, like his, he's gotten pretty deeply involved in the sell-in process this week and how the, how the, what, you know, what, how the discounts look, the structures, the, even the website, there's been a, a number, I would say a number of changes 
And, you know, he's, he's commenting right away when, you know, they're discussed on, on acts of like, Hey, we're, yeah, we're trying to, we're trying to clean up. Um, it's, it's a bit confusing. And I, I've always said that this is what the thing I've always said to, to people when Tesla did that huge, huge, the first huge price cut, I think it was January 12th of last year, 2023. Right. Everybody thought we were going to wake up on January 13th and like the phone lines would be busy. The website would be off the hook and people are just buying Tesla's. And that's not the case because there's an awareness problem. Our Twitter bubble was aware of it, but that's right. you know, a couple of thousand people. The world was not aware of it. And it takes so much time for the world to be aware of it. And it's, and it's to the point where now it's probably taken over a year for the world to realize that, you know, you can get a Tesla either for a great lease rate or a great out the door financing rate. Um, and then it looks like Tesla's really starting to look at the financing side of it. And if they, if they are indeed going to buy down rates, then they're really, I think they're directly attacking one of the bigger issues, which is the access to loans and the rate to which those loans are at and the affordability. Cause they've already done the big, they've already chopped all the big wood on, on, on the MSRP of the product. Like the, these, la what Tesla has done since I guess May of last year is not is not going to meaningfully impact consumers. Hundred dollars here, five hundred, a thousand here. Sorry, there's going to be number one awareness issue. Like co consumers are just not going to undersee that. Two, it's going it's confusing with the inventory discounts, the website. Di like it's confusing. So if they can just say, look, we've got the prices really low. There's they're for value for dollar. They're they're better than any ice vehicle in its right. class. So we're there and now we're going to get you the best rates you can possibly get. By the way, on, on the, uh, the loan side, about 80% of people finance their vehicles. Right. And I believe the loan rejection rate metric, which I think the New York fed tracks, um, hit an all time high. I think they've only been tracking it for a decade, I see. but the loan rejection rate basically got to somewhere around one in six people that went in for an auto, this is auto loan rejection rate. Right. One in six people that went for a loan were rejected. That could be one in six people trying to buy a Tesla. Right. Too. Absolutely. And probably you probably would be maybe even a higher rate since they're a, a more expensive vehicle. More expensive. People are doing that stretch. Right. And um, yeah. So I thought those are that's an interesting, you know, response to the to the data and what's actually happening. Yeah. And I think we also continue to have the FUD with regard to the charging problem. I've seen actually more about that in the last week, I think, than I've seen in a long time. Lots of different places, different kinds of articles, different kinds of people coming in with the whole, well, you know, the electric cars, you can't get them charged. You know, there's all these problems getting them charged. And uh, I don't guess that's a problem in Europe because they've had, you know, all of their charging stations work. Um, and that's not a problem in China, I guess, because maybe all of their charging stations work. But in the United States, where we're losing, we're just losing that big middle of the country where we've only got two to five percent take rates. Um, people in the in the in the middle of the country think that you can't get your car charged. Yeah. And and I went and drove to um I'm in the Midwest and I drove to Indianapolis for the eclipse and I had a, a beautiful just stopover in the middle of Indiana. 20 supercharger Tesla supercharger stalls, two were occupied, plugged in 250 kilowatt charging car was charging at 900 miles an hour and, uh, in, in no issue. And then on the way back, I really didn't even need to stop, but I stopped for 10 minutes. And by the time everybody was done going to the bathroom and grabbing a drink, the car was ready to go. Right. So, um, of course that's one example, but I've in, in my 11 years of driving a Tesla all over the place. I've never run into an experience where I couldn't find a place to charge. I'm not saying it hasn't happened to some people at some point in time, but what I'm saying is, is they have the most reliable network that I think the stats are 99.6% uptime or greater. So they're, they, they, this is a competitive mode for Tesla and it's part of the solution for autonomy as well, which is a great, is a great avail, highly available uh, charging uh, system. Yeah, the only time I've ever had a problem, uh, we, we were literally in Death Valley, not just near Death Valley. No, we were in the resort at Death Valley. We had not brought our uh, our converter, and there was no Tesla charger in the 
I don't know, I'm, must be a town of 300 or something. There was yeah. no converter there. So we had to drive to, uh, but we made it to the local town and we made it, you know, but uh, I mean, that talk about a, you know, Cucamonga type experience, Death Valley. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You don't want to be caught there without the AC. Yeah. <laughs> So um, we have uh, the Mega Factory announcement today, uh, or maybe a confirmation of more more than anything. So a Mega Factory in um, in Shanghai, we're going to get that baby going. Yeah, and it's a it that's not as complex of a factory for them to build as as an auto factory, and they're going to move fast. I think they said they're going to be up and running in Q one of twenty five. So they're going to kick off in the middle of Q2 of 24, and they're going to be up in Q1 of 25. That's that's China speed, right? And uh, and I think they're gonna they're gonna ramp well. I think they're gonna, as long as there's no input material issues, I think they're gonna they'll crush the the Lathrop ramp. Uh, they're good at this. This is this is you know China has been trained over the last two decades of how to construct facilities faster than anywhere in the world, and then. Once you've got the product you're going to build in that factory, once you figure that out, their their ability to scale from zero to peak run rate is is faster, really than anywhere in the world. So um, I think you're going to see some meaningful energy output from them starting in Q1 of next year, probably Q2. All right, well, let's talk about the main drama. So the main drama of the main drama was basically you called it. Uh, you know, Elon has been more engaged in Tesla the last week, at least from a visual standpoint. Uh, there looks like there's a lot more activity on his part in terms of maybe being involved in the the Germany uh, pay, uh, uh, buy down on the interest rates to zero, possibly the 299 new lease rate on the Model 3 in the United States. Who knows? But there's a lot of that kind of activity taking place the last week. But more than anything else, what the world is seeing what the world seems to think that they're finding out for the first time is that there's a shift in the Tesla um, direction from an automotive manufacturer to a AI company that specializes in robotics. Now, <laughs> we've known about this for a very long time, but uh, what do you think? Is this um, Was any of this done to shake up the troops at Tesla and or shake up the investing world to recognize that he's serious about this? No, I don't think it was done for optics. I think they're actually shifting um, the company, Uh, but it it doesn't mean that they're not going to be a leader or the leader in shipping EV automobiles. I think especially in this period of pullback where uh, legacy and other automakers went from no investment to massive 10, $12 billion investments to a pullback on the 10 plus billion dollars of investment. Um, and, and now we're somewhere, you know, it's zero. Then when they went up to here, now they're somewhere like here. I think Elon is, is may have, I'm not putting words in his mouth, but Tesla still has to lead in the production of vehicles and to do a truly autonomous robo taxi, global ubiquitous network it's going to take a lot of, of vehicles to be produced to remember the fleet size is, you know, a billion plus vehicles in the current fleet today. So it's not only about the 70 million um, SAR globally in terms of what, what gets shipped in the retail every year. It's about changing over the fleet and you can't change over the fleet if you don't have a high volume global manufacturing system. So I believe what's happening is, is there's it's not like they're killing one program over another. I do believe that they're focused on a next generation platform. Uh, and, and I could do a whole show on just explaining modular assembly and unbox, but what it's going to allow them to do is it's going to allow them to postpone design decisions, product decisions, and manufacturing decisions to a later stage in the process. Oh, okay. will give them more flexibility in planning once they're in production and the ability to change lines over. Today, you'll walk into the Shanghai factory or Fremont, and it's like, well, here are the three Model Y lines, here are the two Model 3 lines. And you know, in the future with Unbox, it's going to be more phased modular stations where you're changing pieces of stations over and you're still going to have you know, an assembly, you know, a system level assembly for it to all come together. But it's it it would be more parallel in nature, better use of floor space, and 
you'll you'll be able to make decisions later and they'll have more flexibility in line changeover uh, in terms of line changeover time. So that's what I see them doing. So I actually believe that the next generation platform could spur, you know, a robo taxi vehicle, a compact vehicle, a van. It could pr produce multiple vehicle types, but it's not a panacea. It's not perfect. Mm -hmm. So they may have, maybe they've pulled forward the emphasis on the robo taxi being the first off the platform. I'm not sure, right. but it doesn't mean that there couldn't be a robo taxi and a compact vehicle ramping in 2025. I just think they have a more flexible platform based approach versus design one vehicle, design one manufacturing line, and then scale those number of lines uh, serially. Right. So um, Nicholas Gibbs and I the other night were having a gut feeling, a gut feeling. That's all it is, just a gut feeling that maybe the robo taxi part of this platform might be way earlier than expected, like way earlier like maybe around the first of the year instead of midway through the year. Is that a ridiculous, I mean, it's not based on an iota of data, not even connecting dots. It's totally in my gut. And it was his too. What do you think? Well, there was some data. Um, there was a, there was a, a post out that said that, you know, that there was, it was through a lot of the development process in the third quarter of 2023 but then Musk pushed it back. I mean, I don't know what to believe any of this stuff. If you believe, here's the thing. If you believe that they went to suppliers in Q4 of last year and Q1 of this year for RFQ, um, you'd have to hear from, from Tesla and Elon when they design locked on their robo taxi. And when they design lock on their robo taxi, you can probably add a year to that point in time to when they're going to start system level production they may start supplier production earlier but so, so i my call is that they are probably on track for some sort of supply base ramp up in the middle part of next year and then between the middle part and the end of next year um full-on ramp and system assembly and there's a couple of reasons i'm saying this um one is the manufacturing capex is not off the shelf to do on box. They are doing custom designs of this stuff. And it's almost like it's its own product. Like there's going to be one revision of the robotics, a second revision of the robotics, a third revision until they get it all dialed in. And this, you know, a $25,000 car can't be ramped like a cyber truck. You're going to have to get a lot more speed and velocity in order to, um, in order to really eat into the depreciation of that, ca all the capital you're going to be buying uh, and the run rate you're buying. So you get to have a higher, you have to have a higher ramp slope essentially. So I don't think it's going to be a, you know, ragtag, try to get a couple out the door. I, I think they're going to want to rebuild and get a big kind of uh, velocity of vehicles. So I think, I think we have to a little bit reprogram ourselves. If I'm correct, you're going to have to add a couple of months to the normal time you think about Tesla because they oh. got to ramp and get get supply of vehicles going before they say they're ready to launch. Um, so that, those are my thoughts on it. Um, could it be pulled in? I mean, you boy, you, it would be the biggest secret ever. You, you, <laughs> you would think there would be some prototypes uh, running around or you think you know there would be some leak from some supplier that says, hey, I've got, we haven't heard one supplier. For uh, it to be available at the end of this year yeah. or the early part of next year, your electrical supply base would have to be in production in the second quarter of this year. And I just haven't heard one leak from any Not supplier. Yeah. 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 So I should ask Brian White, <laughs> yeah, see whether Brian's getting anything. Um, all right. Um, if we have um, a, 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 a meeting, we're going to have this meeting on the 8th, on August 8th, 8-8. Um, if the actual production of a robo taxi um, is going to be middle of next year, what are we going to be doing on eight nine? Um, it's a good question. I think eight eight is an unveil of how Tesla sees a robo taxi future, and I would hope that they would they would associate some timelines with it. I would hope they would have a physical fully functioned, fully functional prototype that drives itself on, up on the stage, picks Elon up, 
and then, you know, drives him out of the factory into maybe another location or something where they actually demonstrate if somebody gets in the vehicle says, you know, take me to, um, you know, in and out burger or sorry, what or in there in Texas, what a burger and it does it. And, um, and, and so you're, I, I just hope we'd see a, a demo, a full demo of the system of the app and the Tesla's really thought through this and Tesla is a robo taxi company and you have to start valuating them on autonomy. You have to start valuating them on their Silicon business, on their network infrastructure. That's actually hosting this and, and, uh, enabling it and on their ride sharing business, which could be for people, it could be for food. It could be for a number of different things. And all of a sudden you start thinking of the company in a different way. And Oh, by the way, um, all the investment dollars that they had done in supercharging to distinguish themselves, all the investment dollars that they've done in um, network infrastructure and the inference silicon, all those things should be differentiating the company from any other automobile company because none uh, of yeah. no, no other automobile company has actually done those things. Right. So on August 9th, will we have any robo taxis uh, in service, meaning existing? Uh, drivers of Uber are existing. You and me putting our vehicles out there. Will there, will there be supervised, uh, you know, supervised but yet robo taxi rides uh, happening after after August eighth? Are will those happen sometime later than that, but still before the actual vehicles are starting to come off the line? I think it would be smart for Tesla is if if we're at a stage of performance on full self-driving where, you know, it's many times better than a human, you know, the engagements are, you know, many tens of thousands of miles, thousands of miles apart. Um, you know, it won't be a surprise. Like we'll see it. We'll be on 12, four or 12, five or 12, six or whatever, 12 dot X by August. And it will be, hopefully it won't be a huge surprise. Like we'll, we'll know these, like, are we making these quantum leaps that people think we may be doing in the background? Remember we we've only had a wide access to version 12. Was it been a month or so? Yeah. And you know, we've gotten four releases already. Like what's going to happen over the next two weeks. Yeah. yeah. Um, so on, I would hope in the second half of this year, now, there's a big debate about this, but that Tesla would turn on the functionality or capability at some point between eight, nine and the end of the year where you could, your car could be a robo taxi. I don't think it's a huge, by the way, I don't think it's a huge financial windfall if, if it's a supervised, ro somebody in the seat right. robo taxi. Right. I think they've got to get it to the point where it drives itself pretty reliably. Yeah, but that would be a great, to me, that would be a great transition. If you aren't ready to turn it into a full on, you know, robo taxi with no driver, have it be supervised as a way to start testing the system, make sure the networks are working, start getting rides, uh, yeah. more people into Tesla vehicles as passengers so they can see how amazing it is. I mean, it just seems to me that that would be, I, I'm just agreeing with you, of course. Yeah. Um, okay, let's talk about the rest of the business because, uh, you know, everybody today is talking about betting the business, balls to the walls. Um, you know, it's, uh, and I'm like laughing my head off about the idea that it's betting the business in any way, shape, or form. They have a hundred billion dollars in sales, they've been throwing off free cash flow like crazy, they got 30 billion dollars in the bank. So in no way, shape, or form is this betting the business. But I think maybe the investment public, including me, would like to see them sell as many of these 2.5 million cars that they can clearly make this year as possible. What do you think? Do you think they will, do you think they'll put as much energy into getting from what everybody thinks is going to be a 1.8 million a year now to something closer to that 2.5? Is there going to be a big push? Well, there's a change happening. And I think everybody needs to recognize what Tesla has done over the last couple of days and weeks. Um, the inventory, uh, the inventory reductions are gone in the right. system. The prices were increased as of April 1st. Um, and it's, it, yeah, it's a, it's a much 
you know, there's not all these discounts ever. It's, it's, it's all been removed from the system. I don't rely on these inventory trackers, but even some of these inventory trackers are reporting lower, like a big drop actually. And, and, and this is what people understand the the 90 day interquarter view of inventory changes inside of the quarter for reasons in the, the beginning of the quarter, you are building up and you are putting product in transit to its final destination. Some product takes six to eight days to get to a destination. Some product takes 40 days right. to get to a destination. People don't understand this. They just go look at an inventory chart, like up is bad and down is good. And you can't do that. That's why you need people who understand this. And quite frankly, it's almost impossible to do outside of the business. Uh, but sometimes I try to interpret it, but it's difficult. Um, but I think Randy, to answer your question, and, um, is Tesla going for a bigger, it, it looks like between the OPEX decisions Tesla has made to cut people mm -hmm. and, uh, what they're doing with the, getting rid of the inventory discounts, all the spiffs and, um, and then all the, you know, all the prices stabilizing or increasing, it looks like Tesla is trying to shore up the bottom of this. And it looks like they believe the inherent value of their vehicles are going to go up as software functionality increases. Now, one key price did come down, which is the price, the monthly price of FSD. Right. I think what Tesla is doing there is they've actually kept that price high, kept the barrier high, both for the, the, the all in amount, the 15 or 12 or 15 K and then the monthly amount because the functionality wasn't good and they don't want the system to grow tremendously big because uh, it wasn't good. And, and you, you probably wouldn't have great retention on the monthly 199 plant if the performance isn't good. Right. But if the performance is good and you can get more people in to, to drive up that amount of data you're getting, that's what ultimately what they're doing right now. So it seems like this is a playbook. We're inside of a playbook. Keep prices, stabilize pricing. You're not going for volume over pricing at this point. Um, but work on the awareness where you can with, with uh, X and YouTube uh, advertisements. Work on the awareness where you can. Um, get more people onto the SaaS uh, piece of the business and drive the data up. It looks like we're inside of a playbook right now. And there's a, there's a pretty dramatic shift that's happened. Okay. And um, uh, I've seen a bunch of different numbers thrown around as to what 14,000 employees might look like in terms of uh, a reduction in CapEx. Um, I just thought I'd throw 100,000 an employee on there figuring, you know, even your even your $60,000 employee really cost you at least 100,000. Um, so, you know, right away, you're talking about a real number there. <laughs> if you just had, And there might be a Maybe the number is even higher than that. I'm not sure. What do you think? Yeah, it depends. We have to look at the concentration if they're coming from the factory um, versus or are they coming from the office. If if they're coming out of the offices uh, and they're in their U.S. base, that would be more. Um, I would be more of in like the 300k per person type category. Um, if they're out of the factory, I think yeah, a hundred you know, 80 to hundred K probably makes sense all in. So I think what Tesla has done with their reduction strategy though, is this wasn't uh every manager in Tesla, you know, give up your bottom 10% in terms of performance. And that's how we make the number. It looks like it was, it's been differentiated. I'm, I'm not hearing of anybody in software relating to autopilot FSD. I'm not hearing anything there. I'm sure they, they may have a low performer that they may have dealt with, but in general, it looks like they were deprecating hardware projects or deprioritizing hardware projects. looks like there was a review of like, here's what we're doing. Here's our priorities. Here are the hardware projects we're doing. And it was like, cut, cut, cut. So some of these groups may have had much higher than the 10% um, cut. But I think the difference between this cut and the prior one, the prior one looks like it was more office-based. This one looks like it's hitting some of the factories. We've heard Buffalo. We've heard Berlin. We've heard Austin. We've heard, I think, some Fremont as well. And it looks like it's project based and then some performance based too. Hmm. Okay. So, um, but at the end of the day, it's the kind of thing that I'm sure you've been through in your, oh, yeah. in factory life. Um, and you do it for different reasons at different times, but at the, but, yep. the, but the reality is 
you've just knocked a lot of capex off the off the off the bottom line yeah and you and you now have uh you've strengthened the company but i think the other part would be when you do that generally it's because you're redirecting your energies you're redirecting your you want to make a point about what it is and again not just optics but a real point to your to the managers and everybody else that's involved that this is where the emphasis is and obviously the emphasis is on robo taxi but i doubt whether that's going to subtract anything at all from optimus what do you think <laughs> yeah no no i i i uh i think they're going to protect i think they're protecting from a hardware perspective, the next generation platform and Optimus. And I think those are two clear priorities. Look, the next generation platform is going to be focused on massively reducing the process time to make a vehicle and massively re and improving the output per square meter so they can get more out of existing floor space at a lower price point. The lower process time equals lower, lower CapEx needs, lower uh, human cap human operator need and um you know lower the lower process time you're just going to get a, a much lower cost structure better utilization of fixed assets so i think they're squarely focused on that and i think everything else was probably up for grabs in in, in my opinion um i think they they're they're i think they're focused on making cybertruck a success and ensuring that that scales appropriately um, and it looks like they have a big winner, I think on their hands with this, the, the, the fact that we have this, uh, you know, many people that are, are willing to pay, you know, 30, 40, maybe more percent over what invoice would be a year from now is pretty telling. So let me get uh, personal. How's it going with you and your FSD? Good. I mean, I, I'm upgraded. Um, I have a, a hardware four model X oh, okay. and I'm on the one dot or 12.3.4. Okay. Uh, and I would say I've, I've gone from pre version 12. I was probably doing 20 to 30% of my driving in FSD. And now I'm doing closer to 90% okay. of my driving on FSD. So it's become a lot more useful for me. Um, it, there are issues um, that still need to be resolved there, uh, there are some situations where I need to uh, intervene with the accelerator. Um, I haven't had a safety, I would call it level issue, okay. but I've had it do a couple of hard stops for me, uh, especially between, you know, day and night, uh, you know, on a highway that would be, that could turn into a safety issue. So there's, st there's definitely still some work to do on it, but it's, I mean, it's night and day versus the prior revision, but uh, B11, but that, you know, and now we have to get it to the point where, you know, it has a meaningful jump where, you know, it passes the grandma test, right? Yeah. So I've been asking a different test now. My new test is of those last four or five rides that you can remember, would you say that if you had not gotten in the car, but you had just told the car, go here, could it have gotten there? Yeah. Um, that's a good metric. I'd have to go back and, uh, and then think through some of my rides. I certainly have several rides with no interventions. There's no question about that. Um, there's just been a couple of situations where it gets itself into a little bit of an area and it's, it's like, okay, I, I need to do a three point turn here to get out. I need to go in reverse and that functionality is not in right, there yet. Right, yes. So I think when that functionality and that logic gets in there, which it looks like it's, it's going in, um, I think we're off to the races there. I think we're going to make some fairly significant, dramatic improvements just by all the compute capacity. And there's some estimates that that says Tesla's well ahead of bringing up their compute capacity even more. I mean, Elon, you know, he responded to that. Yeah. There's some graph about you know Tesla being six or seven and XAI being much later in that or further down. And, and he's like, no, we would be second on that graph. Yes. If this right, was right, properly right. graphed. So that was a big tell for me. And um, so it looks like they may be way ahead of bringing this up. Well, the AI on zoom seems to be going wacko because we keep getting a thumbs down popping up on your screen and neither you nor I are doing that. So I don't know why that's popping up. 
<laughs> but we're gonna have to oh, talk to Zoom about why that thumbs down is popping up. We have some little gnome back in the <laughs> someone doesn't like me. It's okay. I wouldn't be the Somebody first. Somebody doesn't like you. <laughs> All right. Well, <laughs> Jeff, as always, I think the good news is I think that I think that's the new metric that we got to start using. We need to add that to the bottom of the list at the end of every ride. Would the car have gotten here without me? Um, yeah. I think, it, like you say, most of the time, it's just tapping that ex the accelerator for a second because there's somebody behind you that you're you're frustrating yeah. and causing impatience. Um, and uh, if most of the rides would be successful, I mean, if it's a pretty good sized chunk of them and we still have three and a half months before eight eight uh you know maybe maybe we'll have a robo taxi fleet in the end of august uh actually out there uh, uh without I mean, it comes down to the rate of improvement yes. we're clearly not ready today but we clearly made a quantum leap and it's really going to come down to that rate of improvement yeah all right well you know what i'm going to let you go because i think you have a hard cut and then yeah. I'm going to finish up by talking to people about what's going on in the markets right now. Thank you, Randy. All right. Okay. Thank you Take so care. much. Bye-bye. Bye. All right. Let's see where the markets are. We have got, um, let's uh, start with Tesla. Of course, what is it? It, it was down um, a, a $1.66 in the regular uh, day today at one fifty five forty six, And in the aftermarket, another $0.62 cents at $154.83. So given all the stuff that's going on and given the rough day that the market had today, because the Dow was down 45, the NASDAQ 181 off today, and the S&P down 500, pretty much all of the Magnificent Seven was down big, including NVIDIA, down 33 to 800, excuse me, down to 840. So Tesla held up pretty well. In fact, out was a little bit of an outperformer today compared to its peer group. Let's go ahead and look at bonds because bonds were actually doing okay today. If you like, if you like them coming lower, um, so we had bonds uh, had uh, at 4.5, 4.58, call it 4.59 now, up just a tad, four tenths of a basis point in the after hours. We're not going to be able to see the rest because we're three minutes too early. Maybe we'll still be on in three minutes. We'll check. We've got the oil basically flat in the after hours, sitting at 8271. It came down big time today, uh, down about 3% from 85. Um, you've and right now it's showing unchanged at 8269. Brent at 8729, same thing, down about 3%, about uh two dollars and seventy cents. Eh, you know, not even 270, really 170. Um, okay, so less than three percent today, but it was three percent from where it was, call it last uh, Thursday. Uh, natural gas up a little in the uh, after uh, the pre-market um, after having dropped quite substantially the last couple of days. Um, we've got gold uh, down a little tad, but still at 2,381, but well under the 2,004 where it's been recently. Uh, silver down a little, copper up 4.341. 4 and we have got, listen to this one now, we have got the Bitcoin down. This is overall today. 1518 at 61292 the day before the having so we'll see what happens with the having tomorrow we've got equities right now sitting at the dow is unchanged at 37990 we have got s&p up to uh, 50 that's 0.05 and nasdaq rebounding a little bit from its big fall today up 22.25 or 0.13% we have got the Fed chairman saying today, everybody saying today, pretty much everything you hear right now, I think there's not going to be any cuts. There's not going to be cuts this year unless we get into a clear, clear evidence of a recession. I don't think there's going to be any way we could have clear enough evidence that inflation is back down to 2% or anywhere near 2% by the end of the year. Now, it may be at 2% because, again, we can look at what trueflation is saying versus what the Fed is, the the CPI, what the federal government is saying, uh, and maybe we really are at 2%, but basically we have to go by the CPI, PPI, and PCE, at least for now, um, and it's not anywhere near 2%. So I'm saying no cuts this year. That's my current stand, uh, stance. I'm saying 10% chance, maybe 20%, 10 to 20% chance of recession. It will probably come from 
consumers running out of money. That's the one factor right now that's a little hard to predict. It could always always come from you know, a, a black swan event. It could come from a, a war event. It could come from something out of the blue. But right now, I don't think it's going to come from labor cuts, but people are spending more than they have, and it is going to come home to roost. Um, okay, let's go back. We can go check those bonds now just for fun because we have hit the we've hit the time. And um, let's see. We have got the tenure is now only down two tenths of a basis point. So call that unchanged. The two year, half a basis point. And we've got the two month, two tenths of a basis point also. So really not a lot going on with the bonds here in the pre-market. All right. Well, I think that's all that I've got. Um, listen, um, uh, check out Scott Walter. You probably didn't see it. There was technical difficulties with Google today, with Google, with YouTube today. Um, and so you probably didn't see the Scott Walter video, which was an amazing video, um, but it, it was not getting properly sent out. Even this one, I'm going to be interested to see whether this one really gets, um, whether YouTube is doing what it's supposed to do with my videos right now. I've been putting up some conservative, uh, some those new uh, Elon Musk X post videos, which have some conservative conversations on them. And all of a sudden today, my videos don't seem to be getting the reach that they were yesterday. I had a conversation with some people at YouTube about this. And they said, no, everything should be just fine. Give it 24 to 72 hours and see if everything gets straightened out. Anyway, but in case you didn't see that video, I will put the card up here. Scott Walter talking about the new Atlas Plus, the, the second generation, however you want to call it, Atlas out of uh, uh, Boston Dynamics. Very interesting new device they've created and a very good show, as always, with Scott. So check out that card, and we'll see you first thing in the morning with After the Bell. Been great talking to you.